This is Changemakers with Katie Gore, finding the right solutions for the affordable housing community. This week's Changemaker is Mark Thiele, the CEO of NARO, the oldest and largest industry group, which serves 3 million units, 8 million people, and comprises more than 20,000 housing and community development agencies. Mark is a respected housing leader and most recently served as interim CEO of the Houston Housing Authority. Mark has also worked extensively with small, mid-size, and rural housing agencies. He's also spent some time with us here at Quadell. Mark, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Katie. I really appreciate you having me, and I appreciate that you create a, a space for housers to have a voice. Thank you. Well, you're welcome. This has been a great forum for us to get out the good news of affordable housing, so to speak. But first, I want to pause here and talk about Mark. I want to talk about you because I think a lot of our listeners are going to know you associated with NARO, but I want them to also get to know you. Tell us how you got started in affordable housing. That's probably a good place to start. Yeah, absolutely. So for me, this really all got going a little over 23 years ago fresh out of the University of Chicago, I'm a proud Maroon, Um, you know, what am I going to do with my life? And uh, somehow I knew it would involve the fundamentals. When I have the opportunity to speak to our members, I often put it like this, food, clothing, and what? And I see folks reflect for a second and then it's shelter, right? Fundamental. Our members are doing one of the most important jobs in the world. You go back 23 years ago, of course, to me, it wasn't quite that clear. Um, this is something you, you grow into. So my path was Chicago Housing Authority, Houston Housing Authority, Memphis Housing Authority, and then the road home in Louisiana, which was that massive Katrina Rita recovery work, followed by DEAP work at Harris County Housing Authority, and then in New Orleans at Hano, and then back for you know, Houston Housing Authority, the sequel for 12 years. So it's, it's really traditional housing, disaster housing, and then a phenomenal opportunity to work at uh, a large housing authority. At the same time, right, there's this connection with NARO that's developing. And we have we, um, national NARO. Uh, we have eight regions. We have a, a large number of state chapters And so my connection kind of began simultaneously at the national level and at the state level. I'm super proud of my relationship and my relationships, really, with Texas NARL. And you begin with kind of doing committee work and move up into leadership. So what kind of happens professionally is you become more and more involved. Your view expands. You begin to see the field better. Um, and, And for me, you know, to kind of come back to some major themes, fundamental correctness of everybody deserves a safe, decent place to call home. The magnitude, you alluded to this earlier, of the challenge we've been up against and will continue to be up against. And then being enveloped in a family of passionate and expert housers. I appreciate having the opportunity to reflect upon all this. It's great and maybe rare, I'm not sure about the total history here, but to have a Hauser really being at the helm of several of these national organizations, because when we go and we talk about advocacy or regulatory change or whatever the needs are, you know, legislatively or even funding, it's great to have somebody who's walked the steps that you have and to have that perspective. And I think that having say, a person can who's- I, I'm sorry to interrupt. Can I yeah. say that you, you yeah. had a role in that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Explain that. All right. Well, well. so, what, you know, what I left out of, of the story was that first part of the arc was with Quadell. So straight out of, of uh, again, University of Chicago, that, that CHA opportunity was based at the Chicago Housing Authority in a contract that, that Quadell had. Quite a legends right from the start. So, you know, Kathy Rotondaro and uh, Ned Sims. And that's where I met Vita Watts. It was a, a legend in the inspection area. So that, that whole early for me housing authority arc was, you know, with some folks who became lifelong friends, 
Um, I have tremendous respect for Quadellians, and that's where I learned to love spreadsheets, right? <laughs> um, so <laughs> performance one, one tracking, that, right? <laughs> right, performance tracking. And while I was thinking about this, it, it took me back to my very first assignment, which in your collective wisdom, right, was as a housing specialist at Chicago Housing Authority and being trained by the team leaders and having the assignment of, of reviewing that, right? And, you know, as part of all of that, you know, at the time I thought, oh, it's, it's a little mixed. There's a variety of different team leaders delivering different sections of material. Um, and it was a little bit uneven, but with reflection, you know, just the thought of having so many first level supervisors have the opportunity to, to work on training actively, to develop those relationships with their team members, um, you know, a thoughtful way. There's many ways to do things, all kinds of different ways. And we, we uh, change our minds about what we do. A really thoughtful way to develop a connection um, between the, the uh, junior level managers and the staff that they were working with. So I really valued that well, Quadell was there at the start for me. Well, the Quadell onboarding as a housing specialist that, and then now as the CEO of NARO, talk about a journey through affordable housing. I imagine you're a big advocate for mentorship or professional development in your personal and professional roles here at NARO, correct? Oh, without question. The features of NARO, we, we talk about uh, you know, advocacy, advocating information, professional development, lifting each other up and connecting. Um, and that last part, the connection to me has always been the most important part. Now, there's a big tent and we really like each other, right? Um, and folks make these connections that they make across a lifetime. You know, I've heard you speak about Naro's, uh, the five, I think you call them the five pillars, what you just mentioned. Uh, yeah. Mention those again for us, because I want to break those down and kind of dive deep into each of those pillars. Advocacy, information, professional development, uh, lifting each other up, and, and then the connection part. So, you know, within the, the advocacy, Tess Embry is, is really outstanding. And advocacy, uh, advocacy is, is key. We have been underfunded uh, since before I was in the industry. One of the things I, I mentioned is that I got to hear the great Eugene Robinson speak in Cleveland um, he, he uh, of course, a Pulitzer Prize winner for the uh, Washington Post. And he said, frankly, to housers, y'all are not only not at the table, you're, you're not in the room. And we're in the room now. We still have some bitterness in our mouths about Build Back Better. But we have to continue to lean on our electeds and simultaneously uh, advocate to HUD about what the, you know, what the right path forward is. So that, that can be unpacked more. But, but when you talk about information, there's so many things and it's such a technical program. Um, our outstanding policy team has the opportunity to deliver um, outstanding, timely information to our members via, uh, you know, a, a variety of different methodologies. We have an outstanding professional development crew. We deliver over 60 trainings. Um, 60 specific types of training. I think last year we did like 170 um, different iterations of, of those trainings. Um, uh, we lift folks up via award programs. Um, and then again, most importantly is this, is this connection. And that happens across um, the, the entire NAR network. We have three events at the national level. Um, the regional chapters have two or three events, and then, you know, there are events at the state level. And, and that is where housers really make that long-term connection to this trajectory um, as they take on more and more responsibilities, as they better, you know, as I like to think about it, sort of see the field and their place in it relative to moving affordable housing forward. So it's a lot. <laughs> I imagine even with HUD's upcoming program changes, HOTMA, INSPIRE, you know, all the acronyms, I imagine you're doing a lot from that INFORM pillar right now. How is that message going with so many HUD changes coming out all at the same time? 
Well, you, you mean, you've hit it on a, a, a tremendously in, important point. This is a, HUD fundamentally misunderstands at the moment. You know, we've been through a disaster unlike anything we've experienced in our lives, a disaster that, you know, affected everyone in the world simultaneously um, and made every place, um, every relationship uh, a little less comfortable to a lot of uncomfortable, right? And we lost, uh, we lost members of our family, right? We, we lost lots too many people uh, during this process. They had to re relearn, you know, how to, how to do many basic things. The grocery store wasn't safe anymore, right? Going to visit a doctor um, wasn't safe. And you know, we're all on our pathways through that, but we'll be unpacking the effects of the pandemic, um, you know, for the rest of our lives. And one of the things that happened during that period is, is housing became even more unaffordable. You know, so our, our members are up against it. Uh, related to that, and I, I know you know this, the, the job market has changed. Folks took the opportunity to switch. A lot of folks who were near retirement chose to retire. And, you know, younger generations are being more demanding and different about how they approach uh, work. So it's, it's tough to keep uh, complicated or really any jobs uh, filled. And our, our, that, you know, job and housing has, has long been overregulated, overly burdensome, administratively complex. And at this moment, going back to my point about HUD, HUD's piling on. So you mentioned a number of the acronyms. Um, we were pleased that HUD has backed off of their changes on the ACC, but we continue to think that that some of these other changes inspire uh, FAS, CMAP changes, um, HATMA, ABABA, PNA, CNA. It's an awfully long list of additional asks of members who are pressed. The challenge is, of course, our members can do a lot, but it's equally important to do it correctly and the balance is not correct right now. Correct. It's like drinking out of a fire hose in some regards. And it's a group of people who were property managers trying to stay compliant and deliver quality services. And then all of a sudden they had to put on a hat of, you know, uh, clinic worker, social worker, um, you know, healthcare worker for their properties out of their strong commitment for their residents. But yet now, trying to recover to some of those operational things and then now adjust to the regulatory changes. Uh, it's It's been a unique dynamic at the same time where there's additional leasing, tighter markets, raising rents, uh, not really the Rubik's cube of operational efficiency for the industry right now. So <laughs> many people are struggling with so many regulatory changes. I'm glad that Quadel and Naro and many others are trying to disseminate some of that, but I think there is some filtering that's needed. No question. You're exactly right, Katie. So let's talk about another pillar, and I keep calling them pillars. Is that the correct word that you guys use at Naro? They're the fundamental value adds. All right. So the fundamental value adds. Let's talk about one that you mentioned, lifting members up. And you touched on it earlier, and I want to follow up here. You have what is sort of the industry, one, one of a couple, but it's probably one of the largest. It's like the industry's equivalent of the Grammys. You have the NARO Awards of Merit. And I love going to our clients' offices where I can see them from years pass it's it's like this brag wall they have of all of them up there it's it's such a nice eye candy if you will but it represents so much hard work and innovation tell us what those are and how those come about absolutely well uh, you know for an agency there really are two signature programs and uh you, you know you've mentioned one of the two the awards of of merit this last year in San Diego, we were able to celebrate with just under 200 agency award winners um, who had done something outstanding in uh, administrative innovation, in 
program innovation in categories like affordable housing, uh, community revitalization, resident and client services, um, and or in program design. And our members are so innovative, right? Um, they're so thoughtful. They continue to find, despite the scarce resources we talked about, ways, so many different ways uh, to push the envelopes and, and get really uh, cool things done. In addition to that, we do awards of excellence, right? So in D.C. a couple weeks ago, we were able to celebrate uh, 20 outstanding uh, winners in those you know same categories, but who really um, were able to do something that really you know pushed the limits. Um, and you know, one example, and I, I think of the cottages at Green Lake. This is uh, out of Lawrence, Kansas, a part of a new behavioral health campus, um, which includes crisis recovery center, transitional group housing, and 10 units of uh, PSH, or permanent supportive housing, uh, for the formerly homeless. Um, or in uh, Westbrook, uh, Maine, where they developed a partnership with the University of New England uh, to provide the kind of thing you were talking about earlier, uh, a wellness center and a space for service-oriented activities uh, such as pro bono oral health preventative care, digital denture services, and social work for 650 low-income residents. Or in Yakima, Washington, where they've done uh, adapted reuse to create 41 new homes for formerly homeless veterans along a newly formed transit line, uh, both very forward thinking and also, uh, you know, trying to connect folks via transit uh, to their community. So th there's just a lot of innovation among our membership, highly focused on resident success in a lot of areas, but you certainly see a lot of work um, to end homelessness, to support our veterans, uh, to, to support our seniors, and most importantly, to support the many children that are served served uh, through these programs. When practitioners can hear and see these kinds of examples on a large scale, then I think that it helps them go farther and faster at creating or preserving affordable housing. And that is what is so unique and such a great niche for NARO. It's truly a, it's so much more than a wonderful networking benefit, so to speak, but it really empowers the pace by which affordable housing can be delivered. These groups that you've mentioned and how everybody comes together, what do you think is some of the priorities over the next year or so for NARO in this lifting up space? I think of, of, this connection, um, you know, to me, it's it's trying to find, um, you know, different ways to encourage what you just talked about. I, I sometimes think about it as as uh, you know, cutting and pasting. For me, ownership it has not been, the, you know, the particular issue. It's it's the results. It's trying to to find uh, new and innov uh, innovative ways to connect folks to success where it happens. One of the things I've talked to our team about is, first of all, I've made a deep commitment to being in the field. I'm going to Corpus uh, this afternoon. Um, I was in Missouri last week and the week before that, I had the privilege of being in Iowa. Um, whenever possible, uh, I try to find ways to visit either a local housing authority or a, a, a vendor to see them you know, and meet them where they're at but also to think about different ways to connect folks as well. I've, I've made it, uh, you know, important to staff both to appear at these events, our policy team and our legislative team that does regular training. I think actually Eric is, is doing a training right now in Texas. He beat me down there on uh, um, Inspire and Tess usually gives uh, Washington updates in, in terms of uh, you know, legislative, so Tess, uh, our director of, of legislative affairs, and Eric, our director of policy and programs, you know, will go in and provide those trainings as, as best as possible. They can simultaneously collect and share successes. You know, another thought 
you know, as we were talking about, we regularly do the best that we can to collect from members input for the many letters we write either to Congress or to HUD and, you know, provide both examples of successful implementations and examples of challenges uh, that some of the ideas that are underway uh, currently result in. So that there's really a lot of ways. And we're going to get more into the ways, but we have to take a break. Coming up in the second part of my conversation with Mark Thiele, the CEO of NARO, Mark talks about why housers have to think beyond just the housing. Housers do understand and are trying to address home, community, which means you know so much more than, than just the, the physical plant, which is obviously incredibly important. Thanks for listening to Changemakers with Katie Gore. To find out more about Katie, go to quadl.com. That's Q-U-A-D-E-L.com. This has been a production of Forbes Books Radio.